One of the speakers at the Canberra Forum was Jeff Raby. Until late last year, Australia's ambassador to China. He now runs a Beijing-based consultancy advising Australian companies doing business in China. Jeff Raby, welcome to the program. Hey Jim, thank you very much. First up to the sentence handed down to Gu Kai Lai, does it provide any clues, do you think, as to what will be Bo Ji Lai's fate? No. Uh, look, my, my view, for all it's worth, has been all along that uh, Wang Li Jun, the uh, head of the Chongqing police who fled to the US uh, consulate in Chengdu, will probably have a death sentence and that will be uh, carried out for treason. Uh, Gu Kai Lai's uh, uh, sentence, which has just been announced, is, is what I expected. Um, and I think uh, Bo Xi Lai will be handled internally within the party as an internal party disciplinary matter. And uh, most likely it will be something like what they did with Zhao Ziyang after uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989, uh, some form of uh, house arrest, um, but his circumstances will be, uh, will be OK. On to other subjects. You think China can thrive at its current lower growth rates, lower than in the recent past. Why are you optimistic there will not be a hard landing? Well, what we're going through at present in China is a policy-induced slowdown. The government's been at it for a couple of years. They've wanted to reduce inflation, let the air out of uh, asset bubbles, particularly property, and they've been pretty successful. The latest inflation rate's just about a little over 2%. Um, they have plenty of firepower on the fiscal side and the monetary side if they need to stimulate. So um, it is government policy, it's not an external shock, and they've got plenty of levers uh, if stimulation's necessary. My best guess is, though, that uh, if growth slows a bit more, uh, they still will be very cautious about stimulating until they get through the big leadership transition later on this year. The last thing they'd want would be to go into the autumn when the transition takes place with a spike in food prices or the general inflation rate. Political transition is never easy under any system of government. But how much has this year's leadership transition in China been complicated or not by the Bo Lai affair? I think now that issue has been resolved internally inside the leadership. Of course, China is always opaque at the best of times. In fact, Bo Lai incident has probably given, given us more of an insight or a glimpse into what's going on at the centre than we've had for a very long time. But one thing that the Tiananmen Square events of June 1989, I think, taught the leadership very clearly was you either hang together or hang separately. And I think we've been through several months of internal deal making, settling issues between leadership asp aspirants. Um, and now there has been a resolution. Uh, the Beta Her retreat is underway. It may even be concluded by now. And I think we'll see a fairly smooth transition uh, in the latter part of this year. Is it possible, though, that the transition from Hu Jintao to a team led by Xi Jinping uh, could still go wrong? I don't think uh, uh, anyone has foreseen uh, a problem with that. There had been some speculation over whether uh, Executive Vice Premier Li Keqiang would replace uh, Premier uh, Wen uh, or whether uh, someone else like uh, Vice Premier um, uh, one of the vice premiers uh, might get in ahead of uh, Li Keqiang, but I think that is uh, settled as well. Turning to broader regional issues, will China continue to tolerate nations in the Asia-Pacific being its chief economic partner while still keeping the United States as their chief strategic protector? I think uh, China is uh, a realist when it comes to foreign policy. In fact, they're very uh, realistic about these things. They understand, for example, that uh, there are historic reasons and other factors why countries have uh, strong strategic security arrangements with the United States, whilst at the same time having uh, very strong economic relations with China. It's my view in any case that China does not want to push, even if it could, the US out of the Western Pacific. It knows that the US's presence is important for regional stability, and China wants nothing more than regional stability. So the US present, presence is actually consistent with China's strategic objectives for itself. Well, what then do you make of the pressure that China applied to Cambodia not to allow the recent meeting of ASEAN foreign ministers, which it chaired, not to name China in a subsequently scuttled joint communique 
on the subject of the territorial disputes in the South China Sea? Well, that's, I mean, consistent with China's policy at present. It does not want to, as they say, internationalise the issue. It uh, asserts that it wishes to deal with the issue uh, of outstanding territorial claims on a purely bilateral basis with individual ASEAN members. So there was nothing unexpected in uh, China seeking to avoid the ASEAN summit uh, or, or deflect the ASEAN summit from uh, uh, dealing with this issue as a regional or international issue. How then do you interpret the very recent visit of Chinese Foreign Minister Yang, especially to Indonesia, but also to a couple of other Southeast Asian nations, apparently to discuss the South China Sea in the wake of the ASEAN impasse? Well, I think it's very encouraging. I, my own view in the past two years or so, when China's tried to uh, assert itself a bit more forcefully uh, over these issues, uh, it's done nothing to help China's interest at all. In fact, it's strengthened um, uh, the interest of these countries in their relationships with the United States. China has no option in the South China Sea, in my view, than to find a diplomatic solution. And so it will need to work closely with uh, its own regional allies in finding that solution. Um, the events of the, uh, the last couple of years, I think, have put China's uh, regional diplomacy back a long way. And now it looks as if the foreign ministry, led by the foreign minister, uh, has been tasked to try and restore uh, China's position. There is considerable debate within the region at the moment about the relationship between China and the United States. What evidence do you have that, despite the rhetoric from Washington and from Beijing, that the United States and China are, in fact, managing their global leadership quite well, a G2, as you and others have put it? Well, I think uh, it starts at the top with the uh, annual um, economic and strategic dialogue, which draws in very senior people across a range of uh, ministries and uh, departments on both sides with massive supportive infrastructure. Um, the US-China relationship, I've said for many years, is very deep. Uh, it's very complex, of course. It's conducted at many levels, uh, from the top strategic dialogue I've just mentioned, right through to highly informal linkages. Even people like you know, Henry Kissinger, individuals like that, are still very important players in dialogue, in exchange, in improving understanding and building trust. So I think there's a lot of ballast in the US relationship. And you ask for evidence. Well, I think the way Beijing and, uh, and, and Washington managed the very difficult period during the uh, Chen Shui-bian uh, rule in Taiwan is a very good example. Um, and I do think that, uh, to some extent, the US has already ceded uh, strategic space to China. For example, um, I could not imagine ever again the US sailing a carrier fleet through the Taiwan Straits, as it did in 1996. And I'd certainly hope uh, it would never happen again that an Australian Prime Minister would support such an action. In those circumstances, then, can the United States enhance its military presence in the Pacific, as President Obama insists he will, without increasing the risk of conflict with China? Well, that's where it's very important that there is uh, a great deal of understanding, dialogue, uh, trust. Uh, it's very important that countries uh, like Australia um, understand what our interests are and, and are very careful about uh, what we do and what we say. Um, it's, 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 it is a, um, a moment uh, that will require very careful management from everyone. But we'll have to see. I mean, when, when uh, President Obama talks about increasing presence in, in the Asia Pacific, the US has always been in the Asia Pacific, in the Western Pacific, in a very substantial way. Um, and uh, when uh, Secretary of Defence Panetta uh, recently at the Shangri-La conference uh, talked about this, he talked about it in arithmetic terms, going from 50 to 60 per cent. It's not a huge uh, increase. And the main thing is that China understands if this were to happen, it is not about containing China. US has very legitimate security interests in the region. It needs, um, it needs a military presence that reflects those substantial and legitimate interests. Uh, equally, it's important for us and others uh, to help China understand that this is just about our own interests, it's not about containing China, and that we welcome and encourage China's uh, growth and rise to a major power in the region. Jeff Raby, thanks very much. My pleasure, Jim.